Have you ever wondered if the last financial crisis of 2008 has changed something fundamental in our societies? Have you ever wondered if one of these consequences could be the overhaul of our economical system and our government structures? In order to understand the conclusion I have barely hinted at, I want to kick off the discussion by briefly talking about disruptions. Disruptions, such an overused word. Everyone talks about disruptions. But truth is, there's only been three major disruptions in our modern human economy. The first one was the steam machine in the second half of the 19th century, which led to trains, and disrupted global trade and global transportation by decreasing the cost of transport and increasing the speed of delivery. The second one was electricity and automation, which disrupted manufacturing and led to mass production, mass consumerism, and our modern urbanized societies. And the last one, not the least one, was internet and mobile communication, which led to the disruption of the flow and access to information and ended up monetized in social media, participative knowledge, global cross-border co collaboration with websites like Wikipedia, open source university, etc., etc. Today you don't need to be a mole molecular engineer to know what a ribonucleus is, nor do you need to have the pass to the library of a biology university to find a book that tells you what a ribonucleus is? All you need to do is go on the internet, Google it, spend a couple of hours, and here you go, you're a specialist on ribonucleus. Today, you don't need to wait for a journalist to go to Iraq to tell you what's going on there. You can just go on the internet and watch the videos and the talks that the Iraqis have <coughs> uploaded themselves. And we are now on the verge of a fourth disruption, which is blockchain and AI, and is going to disrupt intermediation, among other things, intermediation in various sectors and various industries. It is what the internet and mobile communication has done was um, to uh, disrupt the exchange of information by collapsing the pyramid of knowledge and leading to the democratization of information, of data, of knowledge. What blockchain and AI are going to do is disrupt the exchange of value by collapsing the money pyramid, leading to the democratization of the access to capital. However, this disruption is starting in quite an unusual, peculiar period of our human history, of our human social history. Usually disruptions occur in very healthy environments, economically healthy environments. The financial crisis of 2008, have we really ever recovered? The data tells us we did. Global national income per capita is at the highest it has ever been. Corporate profit are at record high. Unemployment, at least in the US, is at a record low. But don't you feel a malaise in our Western societies? A malaise that is translating into Trumpism in the US, Brexit and in the UK, gilets jaunes in France, the rise of extreme politics all around the world. Why? Because the data can be misleading. A very interesting shot that digs into the data, and it's true, household wealth has increased is at the top that it was. But if you look in the strata, you see that the bottom 50% has still not recovered its level of wealth pre-2008. They are actually now at a level of wealth that is similar to 1971. However, the top 10% have recovered to levels of pre-2008. They've actually multiplied their wealth threefold since 1971. The truth is, our generation is poorer than that of our parents. And thanks to the third disruption, internet, mobile communication, we see it on a daily basis. And it creates anger, because it's an injustice, right? So, why is this dangerous? 
Why is this social unrest dangerous? Because the end goal of a society is to reach a state of equilibrium. The state of equilibrium is a function of stability, itself a distribution function of wealth. When the majority of the population sits in the middle range of wealth, they want to maintain the status quo. They don't need to change anything because if something changes, they will have more to lose than to win. But when the distribution is skewed, suddenly you get to a certain point where you don't want to maintain the status quo anymore because a change, however it is, whatever it is, can be more beneficiary than the status quo. So this is leading to obvious social unrest and social instability. Social unrest and social instability is dangerous because it can lead to revolutions. And revolutions are a painful thing. So how can we fix this without going through a bloody revolution? Because the problem is a wealth problem, we should first look at our economical system, which is based on capitalism. I don't want to bore you with the theory, but in my view, any viable and sustainable economical model should take into account individualism, meaning that every human being is an individualistic creature. And I will quote, I, will, I want to highlight the quote of an unlikely source, Che Guevara, El Comandante Che Guevara, who said, in the future, which is now, individualism ought to be the efficient utilization of the whole individual for the absolute benefit of the collectivity. Indeed, as human beings, we are not equal. Doesn't mean we are unequal, it means we are different. We are different in our origins, in our religion, in our age, in our geographies, in our jobs, in our education. And we should be able to accept, respect, and leverage on these differences to be able to extract the unique insights that each individual can have and can add to the collective society. So I want to highlight a situation where individualism actually didn't, uh, wasn't applied correctly and led to the failure of states. We have Argentina and the United States. Few people know that in the 19th century, Argentina was actually the most powerful economically nation on earth. When immigrants had the choice between Buenos Aires and New York, they would pick Buenos Aires. So what happened to Argentina? The United States now is a number one power of the world. Argentina is a failed state. History books will tell you it's the election of Juan Perón and Peronism. But the election of Juan Perón was years, if not at least a century, in the making. Why? Because of a lack of individualism in the Argentinian society. So what happened in Argentina is that you would get there, you would be working for a landowner. You were an employee of a landowner. Argentina was very rich. And the richer it got, the more this disconnect between the 10% and the 90% increased. Look at the United States. When you were an immigrant, the government would give you a piece of land and they will tell you, work it. So every immigrant was actually the CEO of a small enterprise. And this allowed for wealth, maybe not to move to the extreme of Argentina, but in the middle range to be distributed almost equally. So Argentinians, <coughs> landowners, Russian serfdom, serfdom in other countries in the world has, have created this disconnect in wealth, which led to communism. And we all agree that communism is not really a viable solution. However, right now, capitalism also doesn't seem like a really viable solution. We shouldn't be ashamed to look at capitalism and try to fine-tune it. Because 
Capitalism today is skewed towards money begets money. It's a backward-looking formula, meaning if you're a wealthy man but a crappy businessman, you go to a bank, you still get your loan. If you're a cash-rich corporate, you have access to capital markets. If you're a wealthy nation, you can emit bonds at a very low interest rate. But capitalism shouldn't go to short-term gain, gains only. Capitalism, capital should flow to those who can provide the most sustainable long-term capital. But in this new form of capitalism that we're trying to build, capital is not only about money. Remember the third disruption? Capital is also, should also be linked to knowledge. A wise man once said, give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day. Teach a man how to fish, you'll feed him for a lifetime. But what he forgot to mention is that not only do you need to teach the man how to fish, but you need to give him the money to buy a boat. Because a man who knows how to fish and doesn't have a boat is going to starve. And a man who has a boat and doesn't know how to fish is useless as well. And this is extremely important for SMEs, small and medium enterprises. Small and medium enterprises are the heart, are the power engine of an economy. All of the economical successes, like the Asian nations, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, all of them have a very strong, dynamic SME sector. In the United States, SME generate more than 50% of the GDP. 99% of businesses in China are SMEs. But the problem with SMEs is that their failure rate is humongous. In a five-year period, 50% of FME, F, SMEs fail. On a 10-year period, 90% fail. And it's not because of a lack in capital. It is mainly of a lack of expertise and knowledge and experience. Large corporations have access to the best employees, have access to the largest bank, to the largest consultancy firms, i.e. they have access to an ecosystem that is here to nurture them. SMEs don't really have access to this because maybe they're too, they're too small to be, for the eco economy to invest in them. So in order to bring back the wealth to the middle range, we should be focusing on our SMEs. But how can we do this in the current model? So the current model is a very centralized model. The bigger you are, the more decision-making power you have. What we should be doing is shifting the decision-making power from the individual to the collective. And when I say the individual, I don't mean necessarily a person, but a corporate, an entity. It shouldn't be one or two or three players in the economy that takes decision. It should be all of the actors, all of the actors. So how do you do that? Let me give you an illustration. Meet Orn. So Orn is a character of a video game called League of Legend, or LOL, for those who knows it. It's my favorite character. <laughs> I'm not introducing him to you um, to discuss whether he's half goat, half dog, or half goat, half lion, though I'm quite sure it's an interesting debate. No. I'm introducing Orn because of this. In this game, Orn and other characters have different statistics. These statistics are variables with different values. These values move up and down throughout your progress in the game. Now imagine an economical model where all of the actors, again not the players, the actors, where all the actors have that sort of profile with various variables that could be quantitative or qualitative that comes into an equation to give you a reputation score. The higher your reputation is, the more input and influence you have on the economy, on the ecosystem. 
So now imagine an SME that is looking for funding or is looking for advice or is looking for any type of information coming into the ecosystem. You will have all of the actors that want to interact with this SME giving their opinion or voting on whether to finance this company or not finance it and at what level. But their vote is going to be weighted by their reputation score. So the better actors they are in the economy, the higher input, the higher influence they will have. And this is what is called participative capitalism. So now we can take this idea a little bit further and apply this concept to government structures, particularly parliamentary systems. So I want to introduce what I call calibrocracy. Calibrocracy derives from the word caliber, which is the standard of a person, the quality of the ability of a person. And it's a form of government where it's not parliament that votes on laws, but it is the citizens. Very similar to a referendum, right? But no. Because in a referendum, every vote is equal to one. In a calibrocracy, every vote is weighted by your caliber. And your caliber, which is made up of multiple variables, can take in qualitative variable like your age, your location, quantitative variable, what type of, um, what type of returns you have in your job, etc., etc. And most importantly, when it's time to vote, it will take into account how, whether this law is affecting you, yes or no. An easy example would be Brexit. If we voted on Brexit within a calibrocratic system, and this is just one variable, yeah, don't get upset at me. <laughs> if you were 80 years old, the weight of your vote would have been lower than someone who's 30 years old. Well, because it's very unfortunate, but the lifespan of human being is limited. But it's on the other side of the spectrum, it works as well. If we're talking about a law on healthcare, if you're 80 years old, your vote will have a weight that is more important than someone who's 30 years old because you use, you use the healthcare system more often. And again, it is true, humans are not equal. It's even written in our genetic code, yeah? Some are born tall, some are born short like me. Some are born very good looking, some are born so, so good looking, some are born good at math, some are born very eloquent, and some are born neither good looking, neither very eloquent, <laughs> neither very smart. It's very complicated for them. <laughs> but we should accept, respect, and leverage on our differences because it is through our differences that we can <laughs> extract unique insights that can build up a collective, a collective society. In 1992, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Francis Fukuyama, in his very famous book, The End of History and the Last Man, argued that with the global spread of free market capitalism and liberal democracy, human society arrived at the end of its social cultural evolution and that the last form of government is a liberal democracy with free market capitalism. But history doesn't end. And it's time for you, for me, for us to make history again. Thank you. <laughs>